Greetings from Williamstown. On behalf of everyone here at the college, it's my honor to welcome you to tonight's event, a celebration of 2021 Bicentennial Medalist Nancy Baker Cahill, Williams class of 1992. The Bicentennial Medals Program was created by the Bicentennial Commission on the occasion of the college's 200th anniversary in 1993 to help build and strengthen ties with alumni, students, faculty, parents, and friends, and to increase their sense of pride in the college. The medals recognize and honor distinguished achievement in any field of endeavor by members of the Williams family. The 173 medal recipients to date span 70 years from the class of 1924 to the class of 2007. Another bicentennial milestone is being celebrated in 2021. Tonight's program is one of a year long series of events commemorating the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Williams College Society of Alumni. Our society is the oldest alumni association in North America and quite possibly the world. We're spending this bicentennial year, not only celebrating and grappling with our past, but also examining our present and imagining our future. Together we envision an inclusive society where all alumni feel they belong. We are united in our shared commitment to a liberal arts education, to lifelong learning, and most especially to each other and to our college. Tonight we honor Nancy Baker Cahill and I'll be back at the end of the program to confer the Bicentennial Medal to her. But first I wanna introduce Nancy and her partner in conversation this evening, Ethan Zuckerman, class, Williams class of 1993. Ethan is a media scholar and internet activist and is currently Associate Professor of Public Policy, Communication and Information at the University of Massachusetts. He is the founder of UMass's Institute for Digital Public, Public Infrastructure, a research group that is studying and building alternatives to the existing commercial internet. Ethan spent the better part of the past decade leading the MIT Media Lab and Comparative Media Studies at MIT. His frequent speeches and writings challenge all of us to use technology mindfully to both broaden and deepen our civic engagement. Ethan is himself a Williams Bicentennial Medalist having received the honor in 2014. Please join me in welcoming Ethan. Tonight's honoree, Nancy Baker Cahill, class of 1992, is an artist working at the intersection of fine art, new media and activism. She is the founder and artistic director of Fourth Wall, a free augmented reality public art platform exploring resistance and inclusive creative expression. Nancy was included in Art News's list of 2021 deciders and her recent augmented reality public art project, Liberty Bell, earned features in the New York Times, Freeze Magazine, Smithsonian Magazine and the Washington Post and appeared in Art News list, the defining public artworks of 2020. Her 2018 TED Talk, Augmented Reality as an Artist's Tool for Equity and Access, launched Nancy's international public speaking practice, and she has spoken at numerous academic institutions and conferences. A few reminders before turning over our virtual stage to Nancy and Ethan. Please feel free to utilize the chat as a space to engage with the community and share any reflections or comments you may have. I see you're all active there already. And if you have any questions for Nancy, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar at any time during today's talk. We'll have dedicated time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, but you can submit your questions as you think of them. Please join me in welcoming Nancy and Ethan. Nancy, I was hoping that you were going to start by uh, showing us a couple of pieces. Can we get you to uh, share some of these recent works so that we know what we're talking about? Absolutely. Let's see. I'll just start here. Can everyone see this? We can. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just give you a little brief, the briefest of context here. Um, as, as Maud pointed out, I am working in more traditional media like drawing and some of the more futuristic media like virtual reality and augmented reality, sometimes known as XR. And I just included the drawings at the top of this slide to give an indication of where my drawing began or, or has its, its roots and how it's developed as I've started to draw and engage with immersive media, new media. And here's it, I'm gonna just briefly play, as you can see, I'm, I am a little obsessed with this image of kind of quiet cataclysm. 
And this is a piece called Hollow Point 101. This was the very first VR drawing I ever did. And it's entirely related to the drawings on paper. They share a certain visual vernacular. Um, and those, that sort of sharing that, that conversation has really kind of collapsed into something that's really interdependent now um, and, and somewhat indistinguishable at times. And uh, this is an example of augmented reality. I don't know how many people are familiar with this. This is a piece I created for the Desert X Biennial about climate change and kind of thinking about climate change as a hyper object. And this was geolocated, which means it was situated using GPS technology, um, installed using that technology at the Salton Sea in California. And it, it, um, it kind of moves in this way throughout, and it's accessible through your, um, through phones or tablets that have AR software that can support this kind of, um, this kind of artwork. This is the more recent piece that Maud referred to called Liberty Bell, and it appears in six culturally or historically significant locations along the Eastern seaboard. It's actually up through 2021, although it, it launched on July 4th of, of 2020 for uh, some reasons that are obvious, some that are not. And it has, in this case, sound was really as important and immersive sound was as important as the visuals. So although you're gonna hear the sort of tail end of the soundtrack, I will just say that this is a this is a piece whose sound mirrors the animation and the animation begins somewhat calmly and becomes increasingly dissonant, um, arrhythmic and, um, and, and uh, in, unharmonious. So here we go here. <laughs> And finally, um, and well, not even finally, but also, um, this is a lens that I created. I was commissioned to create this for uh, Snapchat. It's a it's a it's a it's a AR lens, and I took the opportunity again to comment on climate change. This piece is called Last Dance, and I put it over the LA River. That moment where the figure starts breaking apart just gets me every time. It's it's uh, just that sort of moment where you realize how powerful AR, or as you sometimes call it, XR, um, can be as a medium for this. But I, I want to start with talking about drawing. I mean, even over your shoulder, um, you have this remarkable layered uh, work in graphite. You've said, uh, I think in your TED talk, that drawing in some ways is, is sort of your safe space or your happy place. It's a place where, you know, clearly you just have piles and piles of technique, but it also feels like you've been trying to escape the page uh, in your career. Can, can, we, can we talk about when you started shooting your drawings? <laughs> yes, we can. Yes, thank you so much. That's a great opening. I uh, drawing. I do really think of drawing as my first language. It is. It's the one place I feel, um, if not articulate, I can articulate things at times in ways that I can't with 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 language, um, traditional language. But yes, I I have always had um, this impulse to. It, it's funny. I feel like I've been trying to get to VR, trying to get to an immersive type of expression from the beginning, whether it was in video or um, in, in immersive installation. But yes, shooting, shooting my, my very early drawings, um, I, just a quick bit of history because it, it is, it, you know, I came to that, that was one of the first series I created when I returned to my practice. I had taken many years off to be a parent um, and to, to kind of find my way creatively and artistically. But yes, there's, there's something also deeply performative about that, not performative in the way that we think about it today sort of on social media, but in, in terms of engaging the body. So I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to puncture that space, that plane in many ways, that fourth wall and to have some kind of commentary about violence and beauty coexisting and, and, and also sort of think about the in, intoxicating nature of, of violence in America and how that might be mediated or mitigated. So that was, um, that was a, a long time series that ended up being very important to me as an artist because it, it ultimately led me to collaborate and work with um, Homeboy Industries here in Los Angeles, which is an incredible organization that serves um, formerly gang involved and incarcerated 
And, and those those pieces are really remarkable. So there's a, a series of pieces where you're where you're shooting your drawings and then painting flowers around them, and almost in a way of of sort of feeling like that wasn't fully satisfactory or it wasn't the full articulation. Then you start working with these wonderful collage artists who are doing these deeply personal collages, and then inviting you to shoot them and then sort of paint the blossoms. But it feels to me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, like this ends up leading you towards hollow point, which I read as being very much about the same violence, but you've now moved it sort of into 3D. What's that moment like the first time you sort of take this 2D and you've really been pushing it and suddenly you've sort of popped it out into this space where you can spin it and turn it in the, in the way that we just saw in, in the video? Well, that's a great question. It really came out of this desire to um, to increase that, you know, I think a lot about sort of embodied cognition and how we know things in our bodies and through our bodies. And the opportunity using VR to create, to basically put you inside of a drawing. In other words, to really just collapse that artificial boundary and, and allow you to literally feel it and to feel and to stand in it and to walk through it and to be led by your own curiosity and and have some agency in that decision making felt felt sort of urgent to me and so when i it actually came out of a moment of great frustration i was i was struggling with i'd made this very big immersive installation of drawings that had to do with trauma living in the body and um and it was and i was trying to get get at that deeper thing that i wanted to i you know it really is like an it's a physical urge i really just wanted to put people inside and it was a curator who suggested VR and and that was a real light bulb moment for me because I actually recalled being an undergraduate at Williams and being in either Paige Beatty's or Mark Reinhardt's class and having them talk about VR as a tool of political empathy as a tool used really more in this case for immersive journalism but um, and that had stayed with me as this little seed in my head and so when I had the opportunity to do it and start to play um, it just cracked open an entire new world. It's sort of remarkable to, to think about, you know, reading and learning about that in the early 1990s, because of course, um, the, the, the actual physical manifestation of VR at that point was in its really early stages. Um, VR continues to, to sort of evolve. One of the things that I found so interesting when you've talked about um, VR, one of the things you've mentioned is that it can be very isolating. It's something that you end up experiencing with a, a headset um, sort of by yourself. Is that, is the isolation what got you to start thinking about augmented reality, this sort of layering of these drawings and these animations on, on top of the physical world? Yeah, it absolutely did. I mean, as much as I love VR and I and I still have a sort of heart pounding love affair with it as a medium, I it, there is a barrier to entry, and that barrier is very concrete. Um, the barrier is hardware. The barrier is electricity. The barrier is Wi-Fi. Um, it's economics. There's there are all kinds of things, um, and so I really wanted to create. I wanted to sort of explode that experience into a more accessible one, and to engage conversation around this work to make it. To kind of challenge what what it could do out in the world, and um, and sort of away from all kinds of institutions of permission and gatekeepers, and 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 really offer it to an unknown and unseen audience, and and have a conversation and, and collaborate. And um, I'm super super fortunate to have an incredible tech team that I work with, which my of which my sister Louise is a part, and it's called Drive Studios. And so they also they are the app developers, and they they helped me found and create the fourth wall app, which is really, you know, everything that I've done since has been a part of that app. And the app is now really an integral part of my, my practice. I, I love this idea that for anyone who has a mobile phone or a tablet, we now have the possibility of augmented reality sort of coming into play that we don't have to have the headset or we don't have to go into the studio. We can start seeing these things in situ it strikes me that the locative part of your work, locking some of these works so that you actually have to be out in the physical world to see them. Talk to me about that. What, what's, the, what's the logic behind it? Why, um, why do we have to go to the Salton Sea to see that beautiful sort of tornado of, of droplets or ice or, or whatever it is sort of against that barren landscape? 
Well, I, you know, it's interesting that the app is somewhat bifurcated. So one part of it is actually, you can actually take the quote unquote assets, the artworks and put them anywhere you want. Um, and so that's really important to me to kind of invite that, that kind of imagination and, and engagement. But yes, the locative piece is really crucial. And I've been advised by lawyers not to say site specific, uh, or excuse me, not to say site activation, but to instead to talk about idea activation. But to me, it's all sort of of, of the same piece. You know, um, when I first began collab, long before I did any of my own, you know, sort of more large scale works like like margin of error, I collaborated with um, some artists here who work who are really rigorous and working with themes that are. In, incredibly important to them, and I think more broadly to to um, you know a larger sort of civic conversation, and and um, you know what I said to them at, at first was because again my team developed created the opportunity for me to geolocate pretty much anything, and I, what I asked each one of the people I collaborated with was you know if you where would your work have the most resonance outside of any white cube outside of any again institution where would it where would it activate the most discourse? Where would it feel like it could live, if it could live anywhere in the world? And of course, those pairings, whether it, they're activating ideas, activating sites, activating histories, untold stories, um, ideas themselves, that that uh, was, was just really kind of a game changer and it's continued to be. I think there's nothing more immersive than standing in a space, um, uh, smelling the air, hearing the ambient sound, seeing the, that layering and really engaging with what that means in that context. And if you privilege content and rigorous content, I should say, and um, are, are thoughtful about, about that, you know, why did this artist make this choice and how does this piece talk to the space and the history? Um, I, think that's a, I think that's a pretty extraordinary opportunity. I think that's, that's something that you can't do in, you know, within you know, a cube. Or other places. There's a there's a video that that um, you have on on your website of uh, of Hollow Point um, at the U.S. Mexican border. And so in the video, you're first looking through the border wall. You're seeing the sort of impact crater, and then it superimposes on the wall, and then it's on your side of the wall. And it's this moment of commentary on just the arbitrariness of these borders that maybe they can separate the physical but they're certainly not separating the digital or the conceptual or even even the the image of it, it it's a moment that just resonates really powerfully um do, do you do you think this is sort of the future of this work do you think it's going to be omnipresent and on everyone's phone or do you think it's going to be about that experience of place combined with that layering of imagery? I hope I hope it's more the latter. I think we're obviously facing what I wish I could remember what it's I think it's called. Oh, there's this brilliant, brilliant short film that an artist made where like basically every surface is AR. I'm hyper. It's me. It's not hyper normal. It's something like that. But anyway, um, shoot, I'll remember it and I'll see if I can throw it in the text later. But basically, I, that's what I imagine the future to be, a lot of sort of visual junk and dross and advertisement and propaganda, um, which is why I feel really fortunate to have gotten in, in when I did, because I think we've been able to be really nimble and sort of guerrilla in our in our interventions. Um, but I think, I, I think that as with all things, there will probably be a glut of of content we could probably live without. And then hopefully people will really use it thoughtfully and subversively and um, and intentionally. That's my hope anyway. It, it's been pointed out that that most people's first experience with augmented reality is probably Pokemon Go. It's literally yeah. looking through your phone at the street that you're on and seeing a cartoon creature and throwing a ball to, to catch it. Um, it's really interesting to sort of think about, you know, how that can take on these these deeper and sort of more political meanings. What, where is Liberty Bell and, and why? What, what what are the places in the world where, where have you chosen to show that piece? Ooh, that was, you know, that was those were some tough decisions to make. Uh, obviously, if we're going to have a really serious conversation about even the idea of liberty, uh, there are no shortage of locations where it might be resonant, no pun intended, in the United States. Um, even Parenthetically, I, I was so lucky to host a project called In Plain Sight recently, which addressed the human rights violations at uh, all the um, um, 
you know, uh, it, in current, basically the, the um, detention centers for immigrants, which yeah. are, I, I had sort of naively assumed, well, most of them are concentrated here in California and in Texas, in fact, they're all over the United States. And so, you know, that was a very kind of, and that launched at the same time as Liberty Bell. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, we, we were very, very careful about the sites that we chose and we were very engaged in the communities there and in asking them what would be most meaningful to them and, and asking with curiosity and listening, obviously. But it, it did strike me at that moment that the Eastern Seaboard, while being the sort of original, um, the site of, of um, you know, the earliest genocidal or, origins of this country, that, that in fact, we really could have put it anywhere in the United States and it would have had meaning. Um, but we chose basically Boston, uh, the Rockaways, that was a slightly, that was a little bit of a, it wasn't a detour, but that had to, we had a sort of an adjunct Liberty Bell project there that had also dealt with climate change because they were disproportionately affected by Hurricane Sandy and um, uh, Washington DC, Philadelphia, obviously site of the original Liberty Bell, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, um, uh, you know, Fort Sumter is site of the original Civil War or the ignition of the Civil War, the first Civil War, I should say. And, um, and then of course, Selma, Alabama, because it, we knew it was gonna be a voting year and we felt very strongly that we needed to talk about the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and, and think about what that meant in the history and context of any consideration of liberty in the United States. It, it's a really subversive piece, particularly when you show it um, in front of the Washington Monument, right? It feels, celebratory and joyful and and it takes a couple of moments for it to sort of spin out of control and and give you a sense for um how overwhelming how chaotic uh it's sort of able to be um are you able to see those pieces anywhere in the cities uh they are actually very specifically located so like in selma it's right next to the edmund pettus hopefully soon john lewis bridge um in dc it's right over the reflecting pool in Boston, it's over where they think maybe the Boston Tea Party was in the, near the Harbor Walk. In Charleston, it's um, it's you can see it when you go to I think it's called White Point uh, Garden or Lookout or something. Anyway, right when when you're looking at Fort Sumter, and in the Rockaways, it's actually in four different locations. We we were a little promiscuous there, so we did we did um, you know the beach the Rockaway Beach the ferry landing over uh, Shirley Chisholm Park and so that it has a few different locations there and in the, and then Philadelphia it's over the rocky steps so I, I just want to uh, remind the audience that you're absolutely welcome to uh, ask some questions I'm going to be taking questions out of the Q&A um, so if you feel like queuing any up there uh, we're going to move into those in a little bit um, but Nancy, I want to I want to ask about an aspect of your work that that I just find so fascinating. The 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 last dance piece um, is literally a collaboration with Snapchat, right? It's it's something that you get through having Snapchat on your phone. In some ways, it's it's almost the opposite of how we think about an art object as something as having you know sort of a specific place that we have to get to here's something that is is reaching sort of massive audiences. Talk, talk to me about that. Talk to me about, about deciding to, to work with uh, a social media network on it. Talk to me about, about sort of who you're reaching with a piece like that. Well, I, I wanna say from the outset that I, I really approach any corporate collaboration with uh, a probably outsized amount of criticality and suspicion. Um, but in this case, you know, they did commission the piece I felt that, well, if I'm going to be a part of this platform, I should take the opportunity to, again, try and create something that has some lasting power, some kind of meaning beyond just, you know, a really rad filter, you know, um, no knock to them. I love them too. But like, I really thought, well, here's a, here's an opportunity. And I did ask them, like, you know who you're talking to, right? I mean, you're not, I'm not just, you're not going to get like a bouquet of flowers. And so they were totally, they were totally game. They were totally down for it. I will give them credit as an as a as a corporation. They they have a social media theorist on their payroll who's very brilliant, and he's written a great book called The Social Photo. Um, they're thoughtful. They've just collaborated with LACMA to do some AR monuments. So as a as a as an inst you know as a as a as a company, I think uh, they are thoughtful about this. On the other hand, there are huge compromises when you do this. I do not own that IP. 
and that is problematic. And I think part of what it points to and part of what a lot of these collaborations point to is a lack of opportunity and funding for the majority of artists, that there are uh, certain economic um, systems and influences at play that make it very difficult to have a sustainable practice. And so, you know, um, these opportunities come along and you can really use those opportunities to innovate. And I will say, um, in my own defense, we nearly broke their um, software using the animation <laughs> that we did, which felt kind of great. Um, but, you know, um, but it, it's not it's not black and white, but it is a complex and complicated thing to do. I, and, I don't think you have to defend yourself at all. And, and that's yeah. not actually where I'm going in, in the question. Um, I, I think it's amazing um, to bring something that has that sense of fragility and ephemerality um, into something like Snapchat. It actually feels not only like a climate commentary, but um, something about these sort of fleeting digital moments at the same time. I, I, I think it works really well um, on the subject of subversiveness, but, but let's, get, let's get even deeper into the weeds on this. Um, Nancy, you're about to issue an NFT. What the heck is an NFT? Oh my gosh. I don't know that we have enough time. Um, <laughs> uh, I, an NFT is a non-fungible token and it is basically, you know, some people call it a barcode, but it's basically a digital signature that marks, you know, on the blockchain that, that, that identifies what's called in this case, a work of art. And um, there are all kinds of considerations here, also climate related. I did not go into this uh, blindly or without a lot of thought and consideration. The piece that I'm about to quote drop is actually called Contract Killers. And it is about, it's a, it's a piece that using proof of stake, which means eco-friendly blockchain, not cryptocurrency, not, not I won't get into, I won't, I won't make everybody's eyes cross right now with all the terminology, but um, it was an opportunity I felt again, kind of using this technology, using this moment in time to, to critique the medium and to critique um, contracts of all kinds, but particularly not just the quote smart contracts, which are not smart at all um, in this case, but to think about social contracts in general. And so, uh, you know, I live in Los Angeles and we see a lot of what happens when social contracts collapse or aren't even, or, or are not honored. And it's real, it's um, palpable, and there, there are, you know, real world effects of that. So it was really an opportunity to kind of bring those things into conversation. And so basically it's a, it's a dissolving handshake. It appears in front in AR, it appears in front of city hall, in front of the, Hall of Justice. I really wanted to talk about the carceral state again, and um, and then over a pile of cash, which was very satisfying to put it there as well. They all dissolve, and I also have a social contract piece, which is just these two like very hot pink hands coming together and dissolving before they can you know actually shake. So yeah, so that's another way of using it. So so maybe for context for people here who are are not. Um, following sort of where the art world is going with these sorts of things. Um, the whole digital world has gotten very fascinated by cryptocurrencies, uh, by this idea that we can have these permanent um, ledgers of transactions that make cyber currencies possible. Uh, on the one hand, they're very promising. On the other hand, thus far, they're both sort of a giant Ponzi scheme where you know mostly they're being sold to other people participating in it. They're also an environmental disaster. Um, these currencies, at least in their first iteration, require you to burn huge amounts of energies to verify a transaction. So Nancy's doing this in a very different way. There's a different technology called proof of stake rather than proof of work. But this is really kind of a commentary on um, the fact that, that cryptocurrencies themselves let go of traditional contracts. I sell you something, you give me money, you have certain rights to it, and now have sort of tried to center it all in, in code. Um, what does the disappearing handshake mean, mean for you at this point? When, when it, it's almost a little um, worrisome. You've, you've just sold someone an artwork and it's an artwork that literally is dissolving in front of them at the time that you're doing it. Well, I did. I mean, I used the I used AR versus another medium very intentionally for that reason. That this is, you know, this this. I think that there's this this myth that it's all sort of immutable and inviolate, and it's not. You know, if you if you buy, you can buy, you could purchase uh, an NFT on a certain platform, 
And the quote contract can ensure that the artist, part of the reason my artists love this idea, and I understand I love it too, is this idea of accountability that you, you would then be automatically, this idea of trustless trust, right? You would automatically receive royalties on a second, any secondary sale. But the fact of the matter is, there's nothing to ensure that. People, these things, these transactions can be taken off chain. They can have, they can be sold on other platforms. There's, there, there are all kinds of um, loopholes, let's call it. And what, what my concern, I think, and what I'm hoping to critique with this piece is just that these, in this sort of gold rush moment, you know, in the promises of decentralization and the promises of trustless trust, that what we're really doing is, is, is reinscribing old systems of that, that support the status quo. And we're not actually getting rid of middlemen. In fact, many, I've seen all kinds of intermediaries inserting, insinuating themselves into this. And um, that just feels reproductive to me. It doesn't feel innovative. It doesn't feel revolutionary. It feels reproductive. And so I feel like um, this is an opportunity, at least in its, in its early days. And it's not even that early. There's a whole host of people who've come along before, but in this moment of sort of hype to take that and, and actually hold a lens up to it and say, well, wait, let's, let's look more closely at this. It, it also feels like a commentary on just how fragile and contingent art is in general. Um, that, you know, you're experimenting with media where you have to be on the cutting edge of technology, you need a tech team to do it, as well as your own really substantial talents behind this. Um, and of course, this is all contingent on people willing to support this work. Uh, and whether it's, you know, the traditional foundations or traditional art buyers, or whether it's now cryptocurrency speculators or Snapchat, I mean, that, that feels like a, a wonderful commentary on, um, do, do you feel as you're starting to get more exposure, as you're starting to get more visibility, are you feeling more secure in your ability to keep doing this or, or is it feeling more contingent over time? Secure my ability to, to, to make work, put it out in the world, uh, to, to, to be a living practicing artist. I feel very fortunate to be able to, like I have been fortunate to be able to sustain my practice with my work, but um, I'm very much embedded in a lot of artist communities that that struggle more deeply with that. And I'm I'm really pleased that we've got a guild that's forming here in Los Angeles to support other artists. I'm, I'm really interested in finding ways to, um, to be inclusive. And that's what the app is about. That's what a lot of this other work is about. In fact, for that particular project, actually any secondary sales, should they, we built in some, we built, I, I collaborated with a lawyer in a museum and, and also a proof of stake cryptocurrency and a platform. And we built in these sort of rewards and consequences such that should I receive any royalties, I'm going to basically donate them to the Houston Museum's Artist Fund. Because I think to me, it's all sort of a piece, you know, back to like think about Donna Haraway, like, you know, trying to kind of care, create new models, or as you talk about so much, you know, new toolkits for supporting each other and for surviving the kind of outsized challenges we're facing. Can you find a through line through your time at Williams to what you're doing now? Do, do you, when you, when you think of yourself, um, you know, back in the studio art buildings, can, can that self imagine your current self? Can, can you find the ties between those two people? No, I absolutely could not imagine my current self. Um, uh, and thank God there were no cell phones back then is all I can say. But I will say that the sort of learning to think critically at Williams, really um, having the great fortune to have incredible professors in political theory and in art, and in a few other arenas um, really did shape, I think, and, and help hone who I am and where I've gone since. I definitely took a long hiatus before I returned to my practice. So um, I don't know what was influential then, probably other exigencies of motherhood. But I will say that, um, yeah, my activism on campus was very formative and it's felt pretty incredible to um, return to that, to return to that, um, the exhilaration of that kind of expression and that kind of collaboration and that kind of um, calling out and critiquing of institutions and institutional practices that don't serve us. So we have a great question uh, from Melissa Fenton, um, which ties directly to those uh, questions of activism. Um, Melissa asks, in the face of Black Lives Matter, artists and activists took to the streets to create murals in an effort to create permanence in their statements. 
Other individuals then threw paint on these murals to stand behind the police force. How do you view your AR artwork at this intersectionality of art representing protest? Well, it's an incredible question. Um, I think, you know, I think the conversation around monuments and AR is a really interesting one and the subversive potential of AR used in protest for interventions. I mean, I have the great fortune of having my own platform so I can control, and I haven't been hacked yet, knock on wood, but I can control, um, you know, what, what I activate or deactivate. You know, we've had, we've done some sort of salty things over Trump rallies, uh, you know, you can check those out if you want. Um, but more, more poignantly and to your point, like over the summer, um, with the great, great, um, experience of collaborating with uh, a curator in Louisville with two artists, with Brianna Harlan and a spoken word poet named Hannah Drake to create an air monument to Brianna Taylor. And Brianna Harlan lives in Louisville and she had consulted with Brianna's family and created an extraordinarily beautiful monument to uh, Brianna Taylor along with this soundtrack by uh, Hannah Drake. And we hosted it on the app and it's there, it lives there now. If you go to in front of Metro Hall, that's where you'll see it. And um, to me, you know, that's its beauty. It's, it's, it, it kind of occupies a kind of ghost space um, and not ghostly in the, in the negative sense, but in a kind of sense of memory and of idea activation again. You know, sometimes when I, when I drive past works that I know are installed, but I can't whip out my phone because I'm on the freeway, but I know they're there, you know, they, they, they live in that ineffable place that I can't locate, but it's in my consciousness and it's been triggered by that experience by that parent. And so, I mean, I think there were a number of people playing with AR during the protests. It certainly felt relevant to me. And, you know, I mean, until someone hacks the website, I, they can't force me to take it down. So um, I think that's enormously powerful. And, and this is sort of a beautiful aspect of this, right? Because it lets you do things that would be very difficult to do in the physical world. We can't always paint the wall. And sometimes when we wanna paint the wall, it gets defaced in the process. Um, you know, it's hard to annotate Trump Tower in physical space, but it's it's not hard to do it with something like Fourth Wall. Uh, Walter Bernheimer wants to know, are you still working in other media? Um, and, and I don't know if that means uh, more traditional media or, or, or if that uh, media beyond AR and XR. The answer is yes. Um, I, you can't see this right now, but I've got a wall full of drawings in front of me. Um, there's a sculpture, as Ethan pointed out right behind me, this is a sculpture, 3D sculpture made of um, torn drawings. Now, the difference is they are, they are all related, so I, I will end up creating a kind of mutation, a digital mutation of this piece by photogramming it, putting it through some AI, and then messing with it in a 3D software, um, because I'm really interested in in this moment of, uh, of no consensus reality, playing again with some of the themes, again, back to Williams, that we were grappling with you know, in, in many of our classes around around the real and what is what does that even mean? And and obviously consciousness as well. So um, so yes, I'm working in those those media. Um, I'm a little bit not peripatetic, but I I I I like to to spend a lot of time in one place and then I and then I try something else. But draw, drawing is the through line. Valerie Roach wants to know whether it was hard for you to learn how to draw in 3D, what what were those sort of adaptations? What what had to change when you started working uh, within VR first and then AR? That's a, such a great question. Um, it was actually uh, what was incredibly natural was the way it felt. So I think I've always wanted to sculpt and had been too. In fact, to Karen McCoy, I'd been too intimidated. So being able to sort of sculpt in 3D space and 360 was an ecstatic experience. Also, there was no consequence to it in the sense of materiality. It was immaterial. So, so you know, you make a mistake, you just erase it. It isn't like you've just spent, you know, a thousand dollars on a piece of marble. It's it's it has this kind of immediacy to it that that was intoxicating. Um, but what I did come up against very quickly were the presets of these drawing apps. You know, they're very, they're not geared toward traditional artists. They're geared toward animators and illustrators. And so that was a real source of frustration. So I, I sort of learned early on, like, okay, monotone, torque your hand and your wrist in weird ways to get the effects that you want. And, and then it was my, actually my team said, well, what, what if we kind of customize this? Cause I was like, I wanted to have the same, I wanted to share the same mark making as my work on paper. And so they said, well, 
why don't we integrate some of your own brush strokes then? So that really helped to make it feel like a more integrated process and, and one that felt even more natural to me. It, it really does feel like your work. Like some people, when they change medium, you feel like the tool is speaking. It, it feels like the same visual vocabulary when you sort of cross between those two. Um, we have a great uh, question from the other class of 1992 brilliant artist, Bicentennial Medal winner, uh, Camille Utterbach, who asks, we live in a world where it's harder and harder to agree on facts. What happens when we no longer even see the same reality if we're looking at different AR platforms? I mean, back to this idea of no consensus reality. Uh, Camille, I, I think about this all the time. I have, I, I sort of grapple with this when you're, when you're sort of trafficking in in alternate realities, augmented realities. Um, I think that that's a question you have to ask yourself. And you know, how much choice is involved in what we engage with in the, you know, on these different platforms. And I guess my feeling, and I don't have a great answer to that other than, you know, my hope is just that by being thoughtful and by offering perspectives that I feel are really grounded in years and years of research and lived experience, you know, and I'm talking about other artists as well that, that work that I collaborate with or that I work with. Um, you know, we can offer something that might have some, you know, without being didactic or without being too inflammatory, there might be some sort of kernel of intersection, something that might resonate with someone who might not share that reality. And even that would be a, some sort of triumph to me. Um, I think that we increasingly um, finding those points of intersection uh is is i mean even that's your whole book i mean it, it's this is the this is our great challenge moving forward i don't see how we can um can even begin to address i mean if we can't agree to where like who should wear a mask or who should be vaccinated or what you know where are we going and i think i don't think it's i don't think it's somewhere positive um and i think that the role of and and so i think also to be mindful of the role of technology as it further isolates uh, here's what I would say, you know, the more that our lives are sort of carefully curated by different apps that we that we that we choose that are quote free that are mining and extracting all of our biometric and other data without our consent I'm going to get into that. Um, you know, we are losing touch with our civic responsibility, you know, that that question of why should you care about someone 3000 miles away, why should you pay taxes um, to make someone else's life a little bit easier. And uh, so I think in in simply in and this is the drop in the bucket I can offer is just trying to ask questions, invite conversations around these topics, and hope that they are rich enough and provocative enough in the best way that people might give it a second thought before they, you know, go to their next QAnon meeting. I don't know. It's Camille, I, I wonder sometimes if AR, the way that Nancy's using it, isn't sort of the perfect metaphor for that moment of seeing the same reality through very different lenses, which does seem like this moment. I, I sort of wonder um, whether that sort of common reality, but but the different filters uh, is in fact, one of the, the better ways of sort of understanding the lived experience uh, in the world that we have today. It's it's actually part of why I find um, Nancy's work so so compelling because it feels like such a visual metaphor for that experience. Let, let me sort of close out the, the Q&A with, with two William specific questions. Um, Ashley Cart wants to know what advice you would offer for current Williams students hoping to enter the art world post-graduation. And uh, Lyle Baker wants to know uh, what what art faculty members uh, had the most influence on you. Okay. Uh, well, advice, and then I'll answer my father. Um, advice, I would say, uh, I would I would say, in many ways, the world is more open to you now. That there has been a I don't want to call it a democratization, but there are so many more tools that are available to you now. Um, I, I'm going to get in trouble. Anything I say is going to get me in trouble. In terms of advice, but I guess I'll keep it. I'll keep it appropriately vague but pointed. Um, you know, I would say just be as authentic as possible. I think um, being really this is maybe maybe this is cliche, but uh, I for a long time had trouble finding my voice after I graduated, and 
you know, it, it, it took me a long time to figure out what it was that quickened my pulse and animated me because I, I took a quite a long break from making work. So I think if you're in touch with that, if you're intimately in touch with that and you know how to access it, then it's just a matter of execution. How do you execute it? How do you, how do you disseminate it? And the tools for dissemination, as, as you know, are much greater now than they were before. So I actually think it's a pretty exciting time to be an artist. And I think we shouldn't limit ourselves. I mean, you know, you can have a TikTok channel that is as subversive and persuasive and artistic as anything else that hangs in a museum. So I would just say, continue to think outside the box and, and don't let anyone, you know, put you in a, in a, in a category of any kind. And do you want to answer your father or are you going to, you're going to take um, that one offline? Okay. I would say uh, Mike Lear was a really big influence on my drawing. He's a really masterful draftsman. Um, uh, there were a number of art teachers I didn't have the opportunity to work with that I wish I had. Um, I, you know, I would say the deepest influences I had, I think actually were in the political theory department more than the art department. No knock to the art department. I think, it, I, I understand it's quite glorious and illustrious um and has and has been um built up in the meantime but no i mean it was Paige Beatty it was Mark Reinhardt it was Stuart Clark it was um Professor Little Binks Little I think was he was called um Louise Glick the poet um you know these are the the you know sort of legendary teachers who who really changed my life and taught me to think critically and and really blew my mind you know on a on a daily basis it feels like a very Williams answer. People always um, expect the sort of linear answer of this is the person who influenced me and I do exactly what they do. But of course, the whole point of an education at a place like Williams is 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 that it's syncretic. It all ends up sort of building together uh, in yeah. some wonderful and beautiful ways. Exactly. And Camille just pointed out, my, Mark Lear had us read some rather unorthodox texts. And yes, I, I do appreciate the lack of orthodoxy, even if it was traumatic at times. So yes, I appreciate all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, having a little chat. Mm -hmm. that, well, that. Nancy, we, we literally could spend all day talking about this. In fact, the first time that you and I got together to sort of talk about what we might talk about here, it, it ended up going, I think, four times longer than either of us expected. Uh, but we actually have business to accomplish here. So let me just offer my sincerest congratulations and uh, and hand you over uh, to President Mandel. Thank you so much, Ethan. I love talking to you. Thank you, Ethan. And please, let's all give a virtual round of applause for Nancy and Ethan. Uh, it is my honor now to confer the college's bicentennial medal to Nancy from the class of 1992. If public art is understood to be produced by a loan maker of physical material in a static location for passive viewers, well, then you're an utter failure. You have <laughs> subverted all of these assumptions and more. Your augmented realities involve teams of artists and technicians, consist of pixels, and can be experienced in many places or all places by viewers who themselves become part of the picture. Leonardo could not even dream of such things. You helped curate the defining line, a string of AR works along the Los Angeles River that highlighted issues of the environment and immigration. The project titled In Plain Sight comprised the work of 80 artists that appeared as both traditional and AR skywriting over US centers of detention. Most recently, the Liberty Bell Project brought shape-shifting images and immersive experiences of this symbol of our nation's broken ideals to audiences in historically charged locations along the Eastern Seaboard. Your work as founder and creative director, director of the Fourth Wall app enables audiences to move through these geolocated, multi-sensory experiences and to become co-producers with you wherever they happen to be on the planet. In so doing, you have also helped to upend our understanding of intellectual property, to erode the distinction between humanity and technology, and perhaps most thrillingly, to show how the gallery now is the world. In recognition of your distinguished achievement in public art, Williams College is proud to honor you with its bicentennial medal. If I were in person, I would place the medal over Nancy's head, but as it is, I will simply pass the medal from Williamstown to Nancy in Los Angeles. Okay, now's the moment. Now is the moment. <laughs> there you go. Amazing how we pulled that off, right? There you go. Thank you so much. I Thanks really, really appreciate it.
Oh, such a pleasure. Thank you for being with us tonight and congratulations to you. And we really hope everyone out there has a great evening. Thanks for coming, everybody. Okay, thank you so much.